Well, good evening, citizens. And I, I'm very grateful that you took time out of your busy lives to share information about our great city, where it's headed, its challenges, and its great strengths and opportunities. I would like to take a moment to recognize my fellow colleagues in elected government, most especially city council sitting in the front here. Ro, if you'd just stand when I acknowledge you, certainly Sam O'Leary, Council President, Tom Bullock at large, <laughs> Dan O'Malley, Ward 4, John Litton, Ward 3, and Megan George at large. I think it's fair to say that the role of every branch of government is probably harder than it's been in a while. And the responsibilities that City Council shoulders on your behalf as citizens is significant. They have the power of the purse, only they can make a law, and they do a very good job being thoughtful about all the sensitive issues that a community like ours faces. So I thank you, City Council, for your leadership and your commitment to our great city. I'd like to acknowledge Armin Budish. I know Armin is here, our county executive. <laughs> Armand has been very kind to take time out of his busy schedule to attend just about every uh, state of the Lakewood uh, City address, and I'm grateful for that you could be in Lakewood tonight, Armand, and we wish you well. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues on school board. Uh, we have Emma Petrie Barcelona. Emma, if you would stand. <laughs> Betsy Shaughnessy, a longstanding member. <laughs> and our assistant superintendent, Maggie Nedzwicki, is with us tonight. <laughs> Superintendent Mike Robinson sent his regrets. His uh, oldest daughter is playing her last two games of NCAA Division I basketball uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, I think tomorrow night or tonight, and then again on Friday. And of course, what parent should miss those experiences? So we, we certainly appreciate uh, his, his sending his regards and wish his daughter well and safe travels. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the directors of the Lakewood City Government, if you'd all stand. Um, these are the folks, and I know uh, Mike is out there, and, and I know Chief, Chief Malley's in the back somewhere, keeping a close eye on us and uh, whoever uh, might walk in that door as well. Uh, you know, the, 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 the essence of city government, and especially from the responsibilities as a mayor, is, you know, the, the chief leader uh, strives to set the direction and tries to set the pace, but the ultimate everyday work is delivered hour in, hour out, on behalf of our great city by these great directors. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate, admire, and look forward to supporting their continued work on behalf of our great city. We have a, uh, a few guests uh, from uh, former colleagues. Uh, Mary Louise Madigan, where are you, Mary Louise? Former city council president is with us tonight. Uh, and, um, uh, I think uh, that's it on my list here. So, without further ado, um, let's begin the conversation about Lakewood. So I did thank you, and I want to affirm that, that we reflect on this great city. Now, this is my ninth annual address, and it will be my last. Uh, my term expires at the end of this year, and I will not be running for a third term, uh, which would end December 31st, uh, 2019. It remains a great honor and a great privilege uh, to serve as Lakewood's mayor. I have had the privilege of 20 years as an elected official in this town, 20 years. I started off with Betsy uh, and served eight years on the Lakewood School Board. I had the privilege of serving three years on Lakewood City Council. And now I'm in my ninth year as the mayor of Lakewood. And I have to tell you, I never envisioned being in any of these positions. Uh, each post, has been driven by a strong sense, in my case, of both opportunity and civic obligation. I believe the next decade will be very exciting, it will be very productive, but challenging for the city of Lakewood. It will be best served, in my opinion, by new leadership with fresh perspectives on the issues and these opportunities. Tonight's remarks, therefore, are intended to look forward to this decade. Uh, my remarks tonight are intended to create an understanding of the foundation upon which Lakewood's future leadership, sitting here, uh, and you, um, must dwell upon and to leverage the great opportunities that are before us. My hope also is to educate the citizens of Lakewood regarding the issues that they must contemplate as they choose the future leadership of this great city. So let's 
begin to think about what those issues are. So tonight's foundation, our speech really reflects the foundation, and this particular presentation talks about all the themes we've talked about in the past previous eight years. And tonight's uh, presentation builds on the, on the foundation of each one of those elements, and we've obviously had a lot going on in our great city, and with more to happen. So we start every day in Lakewood. We think about it every hour about the four main goals, and I hope that you see yourself in these goals. Economic development, and its importance, a safe and secure city, vibrant neighborhoods, and of course, sound governance, being great stewards of hard-earned taxpayer dollars. Goals are meant to create alignment. They are meant to create synergies, both within the government, within the departments of the government, and with the nonprofits and other agencies that work also on behalf of our city. And I think we are able to share this vision of how we need to work together with these goals, and they drive so much of our effort. We are blessed here. We often think about the greatest asset we have, and that's our citizens and their engagement. You name the subject, and there is someone in this town that has an expertise on that subject and is willing to share that expertise to us. Today, across all levels of government, people have more access and opportunity to engage. And we need to continue to provide new and even better ways for them to do so. Last year in our great city, we had 289 public meetings. I dare say, I hope there was none of, there are none of you that went to all the 289. <laughs> uh, there's fact, actually probably two or three uh, meetings on a, any given Thursday night going on in this building and elsewhere. And those meetings uh, d deliver the conversation, the substance, and the meat of what we need to contemplate as we make decisions on behalf of our future. We've introduced technology a few years ago that allows us to videotape city council meetings and uh, many of the boards and uh, uh, commissions that m m deliberate in this body. The camera that I'm looking at today is in process of filming this particular presentation. It too will be online likely tomorrow or by the end of the week as, at the latest. And that allows citizens in their busy schedules to avail themselves to watching and engaging in their government. But we have more to do. Uh, we have 200 citizens that serve on boards and commissions. And let me tell you, I can't begin to express my appreciation for the hard work that citizens weigh in on very sometimes contentious issues on behalf of this community. And they do it as volunteers, and they do it willingly, and they do it with a great sense of capacity of what, what this community is, 200 of them on an annual basis. Uh, and just today, I received, and as did City Council, three new citizens stepped forward and offered their names for our, their consideration. That's phenomenal. My bet is by uh, the end of uh, this first quarter, we'll have 10 more. And I, many of you have served on these boards and commissions, and you know what hard work it is. But that is the essence, to me, of, of a representative government, when you talk about volunteers weighing in heavily, and we benefit from that every day. Now, we're about to launch a new police portal. Uh, it's a citizen, police to citizen portal. We spent the last year upgrading $600,000 worth of upgrades of the record keeping system of our police department. They're reporting all their investigations. And included in this package is the opportunity to share more information than we've ever been able to do that historically took a person to handle. We're able to share that online to a citizen, just look at incidents in their neighborhoods things they're interested in, they'll be able to monitor more effectively what's going on in their community, and just as importantly, they're gonna be able to share their insights into their sense of vulnerability, where, where their eyes and ears should take us. And we know that we can't protect this city without the eyes and ears of our citizens. Our partners are the folks who live here and reside here and know best what makes sense, what feels right on their, on their street, and having that insight more more than ever, will help us to protect this city. So stay tuned for the Police to Citizen Portal. Also, we have spent the last year in a really in busily engaging, upgrading our housing and building service platform. That too will allow a portal that will allow us to share permit activity, it will allow citizens and contractors to submit and solicit their permits for their housing work 24 seven at their convenience. It will also allow entrepreneurs to mine this data for service opportunities. There are many cities that have benefited from sharing this type of uh, activity in their community, 
and contractors and entrepreneurs are able to see what the need and the demand is and are able to produce services that make sense for that community with greater effect than ever. That's a good marketplace leverage for a citizen engagement. We are leveraging this phenomenal technology, geographical information systems. If you go online today on our website, you will actually be able to look at discharge ports of our sewer system at key outlets along the lake, how many times they've actually been activated and how many gallons they've discharged into Lake Erie. That's part of our engagement to you to understand how we can be better stewards. And we're going to be talking more about our sewers in a minute. So tonight, I also place a call for additional help. The census 2020 is around the corner in April of next year. Here in Lakewood, Northeast Ohio, Ohio, and across the nation, we'll be making a critical count. We know more than ever that count will likely be challenging and important. And so I will be forming a, a complete count committee this summer, and we will be preparing for Lakewood's uh, uh, very successful and accurate count, but I'm going to need your help. So any citizen who might wish to engage in that effort next year in particular, I look forward to hearing from you. I won't be here in that time frame, April of next year, but you will. And I'll still be a resident of Lakewood, uh, but that's an, a major initiative that we need to make sure is very successful. Well, there isn't a day goes by that we don't hear in the news and across the country and across the world, for that matter, about infrastructure. In fact, I was very pleased to hear a report from the U.S. Conference of Mayors who indicated that last week in Washington, D.C., 39 governors met, 37 governors met. And across a bipartisan spirit, there was a genuine sense, including President Trump, about the need to finally figure a way to make some traction on what is likely a trillions and trillions of dollars of investment across the country. Well, here in Lakewood, uh, we know that responsibility. We look at these uh, circumstances, our roads, every day. But we can look backward with some confidence and pride that we've spent $60 million of water and sewer improvements in the last eight years. We've spent $19 million upgrading our water mains. We run our own water system here. We spent $20 million upgrading city equipment to make it more reliable, more efficient for our operators to do their work faster, better. We've made major investments in our parks, uh, and we're going to talk about that as well. In fact, this Friday, March 1st, we will be su submitting the culmination of a decade of exhaustive work as required by the Clean Water Act. A major, one of our, a major piece of our regulatory climate, uh, requirements is to submit a comprehensive report of the path forward by March 1st, and we're going to do that. I was just told that probably the next to final, maybe next to final, final draft uh, is, uh, is in great shape. Uh, we look forward to talking in the future about that report. We've had three public conversations since last October on our sewers and more to come. This report will begin a serious conversation with the U.S. EPA, the U.S. Department of Justice, the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, and the Ohio Department of Justice about what our plan looks like and what its enforcement will be. We have the advantage of a brand new federal law, which we think gives us great strength for local autonomy and flexibility. We're going to be vigorously exercising our uh, defense of that law and how it fits Lakewood in particular, and you need to be part of that conversation. So stay tuned. Now, the one thing we haven't gotten done in the uh, last eight years, which I thought we might at one brief moment in time, was our swimming pools. The fact of the matter is, a serious upgrade of our swimming pools will require probably three years of conversation and work. It likely will require three to seven million dollars of investment, no small amount of money. But the fact of the matter is, if uh, you went to our swimming pools in 1958, and I didn't. I showed up in 1962. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in 1962, that pool looks just like it does today, both at Madison and generally at Lakewood Park. And we know that the swimming experience of our children are different today, and we look forward to making that experience. But it's going to take a lot of work. I won't be leading that work, but City Council, I know you will, and we'll, so we'll have to work hard over a fairly substantial period of time to make headway on something like our swimming pools. Now, one of the things that takes uh, requ is required for success is significant focus and discipline. So here we look at a model of our, and actually it's a depiction of our pavement condition, 2011 to 2019. So I think the city got a little behind for a variety of reasons in the condition of our roads, and we've aspired to catch up. We're not quite there, but we're almost there. Orange is bad in this picture. Orange means a very poor condition in 2011. In the same neighborhood, 
uh, you can see significant process, pro progress. In fact, in 2011, we had 11 of 92 miles that were rated very poor. That's orange. Today, we have 1.5 miles that are rated very poor. Our challenge, however, in the future is to maintain a consistent investment in our streets and their surface quality. A goal for us would be a 25 replacement cycle. We're not quite there, but we're getting closer. So that work lies ahead uh, to maintain that focus. And we know it means a lot to the quality of the street, the experience, and the perception of the neighborhood. Now, in order to be an investor, you have to have disciplined capital planning. And the strength of the city's financial condition is critical to that. This graph shows the drama of Lakewood, uh, particularly in the Great Recession and all that followed, and how we made incremental and solid success uh, over really over the last 12 years, 10 years in particular. And today, I'm very pleased to tell you that we're in the finest, or the best and strongest financial position that we've been in in decades. Uh, this creates a positive ripple effect on many topics important to the citizens of Lakewood, how we can invest in our future. We've been able to maintain, and I believe we can still and should maintain, our low income tax rate of 1.5%. Uh, we are among the seven lowest of 57 cities in the county. Uh, the last time Lakewood raised its income tax, Ronald Reagan was in his first term. You know, a lot has happened, a lot of drama has happened, but I think through sound governance and diligence, we can and should be able to maintain that rate, but maybe not forever, because there will be a time in a place where Lakewood needs to invest heavily in its future, and those resources may need to be called upon. So I'm not uh, going to argue for any second that we shouldn't consider raising this rate at, when it's appropriate. But when we do, we ought to be able to make the case that we've done everything we can to be good stewards of the dollars and how we spend them today, and that we need these dollars to maintain the viability, the future dollars for the cit citizens of Lakewood and its viability. We've seen over the last, uh, really, six years in particular, city after city after city has raised their rates to deal with the issues that they face. Um, happily, that's probably not imminent here. But again, I support city council should they find themselves in that position to protect their city to do it. And if that becomes necessary, I would be right there with them to support the need for that. Now, we must maintain discipline of 411 full-time employees. But we have to work hard to make sure that those employees are the best they can be. They need to be nimble. They need to be flexible to deal with the changing issues of our city. They need to be well-trained. They need to have the best tools we can give them. And they need to have good processes that are challenged in how we can continue to advance our hard work. And we must continue to be an investor in our own future by having a chip in the game, uh, using a poker metaphor, we have the greatest element of control of how we can make sure things happen as we want them to be. Now, our workforce is the most capable I think it's been in a long time. It's the most prepared, and I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of the everyday work. Through the polar vortex and the challenges of equipment and the bitter cold, through rain, through storms, our first responders are stuck on ready every second of every day. They, we measure our response in seconds and minutes they arrive with all the force they need and the team membership that they need to protect themselves and our city. But we can do more. We have to maintain our focus on continuous improvement. We have introduced a culture of Lean Six Sigma. That's the idea of many small changes for the better, leveraging common sense, uh, leveraging operator experience, and direct observation to take a look at every process and see how we can improve how we can do our work. To gain speed, to improve quality, and oftentimes we can lower cost, but speed and quality are just as important when we maintain a solid fixed workforce number. So technology investments are critical to our success. Uh, as we speak, we're upgrading our desktop work to Office 365. It'll be cloud-based. Every operator in the city will have state-of-the-art office technology. Our challenge is to learn to use it to better advantage. We've installed city-owned fiber optic. We've talked about that in the past. That allows a reliability of all our public agencies, including our schools and our library. By the way, I didn't mention Jim Crawford, did I? Uh, uh, the, uh, our library director. Uh, so we work together uh, to, uh, to, to share it. We built a network together. We share that network. We're independent of the vagaries and the safety and security of a publicly shared network, which most cities are on, by the way, so that we can have the reliability, speed, and content of the Lakewood of the second century, both in our schools, in our libraries, and certainly our city. 
We have uh, improved our data security and our desktop capability. We've automated underground mapping of our pipes, our valves, and our sewers. Uh, when you have as much of a vast underground infrastructure as we have, knowing exactly where it is and what its general situation and structure is, aids in speed of response and assessment of challenges. And that includes being able to take uh, an iPad, which has GPS coordinates, and walk around a uh, tree lawn in our neighborhoods and identify that the valve is stamped directly under where I'm standing here by virtue of how we've mapped it. So we were able to dig fast, we were able to get to that valve, we were able to assess it, maintain it, and improve it. Uh, we've also used camera technology to look at just about every foot of our 160 miles of public sewers. That allows us to keep an eye on how it's behaving and what improvements we need to make. We've installed 55 public surveillance cameras, and I'm gonna talk in a few moments about how those cameras help us, and it is terrific. But each of those cameras also sets the future for the smart city. So we're cross-training, we're maintaining employees' levels, we're working on productivity, and we're always focused on response times. And I would uh, seek that this community continue to stay focused on those outcomes. Now we know in Lakewood that our housing is really our greatest sense of strength. They were built 1910, 20, 30. We just had a meeting yesterday in Columbus with the Ohio EPA director, new director, Director Stevenson, and I just heard uh, Lou that she's gonna come up in May to visit us. Uh, we invited her to come up. We need her to understand the uniqueness of our city. Uh, and one of, of course, the things that's unique is our density uh, and how many people live in such a small space. But we're very proud of the nature of our housing, our front porches. And increasingly, we are recognizing the benefit of all the investment that's happened there. And the new housing styles that have come to us Rock Park on the Fairchild site, uh, sold out last year. McKinley Place, sold out. Clifton Point, sold out. Three new developments are in the works, and it will take a couple years for those new developments to pay off, and City Council and the future mayor are going to have to be the shepherds of that work. Uh, but they will add uh, a strength of diversity as well. And we know we need to continue in our uh, investment in our landlord and tenant relationship. Lakewood is so unique in that we have 30,000 housing units and 54% of those, over 16,000 units, are rental. And so this relationship between a tenant and a landlord is baked into the DNA of Lakewood. And we know that creates challenges as well. About a third of our community turns over every year as a result of that, that housing. So we're constantly having to reintroduce folks into, uh, into this, uh, this culture of ours. But we're able to draw on then new life, new breath, uh, but that relationship is fragile, and uh, we invest in it as we do at least two times a year with, with our landlord sy symposiums. We need to continue on that path. We also have learned over our housing surveys that we can expect that 10% of our housing stock, really about 1,200 of the 13,000 families, are always going to be in a state of, of, uh, of, of un unacceptable condition, 10%. So the question is, which are the 10%? And are, we've pioneered efforts that allow us to continue to narrow down that focus and so that we can stay on a path of progress. The challenge, though, is we fix those 10%, and sure enough, two years later, there's a different 10%. So we need to understand that we have to stay on this. It's a relentless task, but by maintaining that focus, we can continue to advance our progress. So 2012, 16, and 18, we did this survey likely 2020 or 21, and it needs to be done again. Now, uh, in, 19, in 2012, we found out there were 48 houses that were actually tagged as number level four, which means a disaster. And if you live next to a level four or one lived on your street, it was a major predatory influence on the quality of life of your street and the value of your house. On the most recent survey, we're down to seven. Good progress but we need to stay with it. <coughs> now this is a very interesting map. You perhaps saw it in the Plain Dealer. But Lakewood's housing market has rebounded faster, stronger, and more consistently than any first ring suburb in the region. In fact, it rebounded faster and harder than maybe some of the outer ring suburbs as well. So I think about this map and I want you to think about it. I believe you've got a copy on the back of your, uh, do you have a copy of it? Yeah, you do. Um, because you look at who our peers are, and they are not generally the in-ring suburbs. And so the question is, 
What are all the variables that got us to this point? And there are many, in my opinion. And I would challenge City Council this year and in the future to remain questioning and strategically focused on all those variables. Uh, to attain it is a big deal. To keep it is an even bigger deal. And that's a challenge that we, we look forward to, to facing. So we had the largest increase in value, 22%, of all of the cities, 57 in Cuyahoga County, 22%. I will tell you, back in 2005, when I and many citizens thought about the future issues, and we produced a report called Grow Lakewood Report back then, we understood housing's importance, and we understood diversity and code compliance was critical to that. But if we had envisioned this type of achievement in 2005, I don't think we would have believed it. I'm certain we wouldn't have. Uh, so it's an astounding achievement, and we should be proud of it. It means that we are a destination of choice for folks who want to come and live here. There are a lot of variables that determine that. We just, I uh, just met a new resident uh, who uh, moved back from South Carolina, uh, grew up in the area, and uh, is glad to be here. I, uh, and we thank you for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, uh, uh, into the mayor's office walked another new resident, moved here from Lexington, Kentucky, happens to be an environmental engineer. Well, we could use a few of those around here. Uh, and. Uh, made a conscious choice to be here. And I love to share the story of, uh, of our, our newest intern, David Boss, who um, actually went to the United States Naval Academy, spent 20 years in the United States Marine Corps, half of which was over in Afghanistan and Iraq, and he was a, a military planner. And he's now uh, moved back by choice to Northeast Ohio, consciously chose to move to Lakewood, he and his wife, um, also an Annapolis graduate, bought a house on Andrew. They have four kids. They're engaged in our community. And they sought their future in home long and far. The Toledo, Chicago, Buffalo, uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. They wanted to be in the Great Lakes region. Um, they had some familiarity with it, but they chose Lakewood. And I have to tell you, that is not an uncommon story. But the real interesting challenge is why? You know, those are the things we, I think, need to continue to penetrate and seek those things that we can control and those things we can't that determine uh, the fact that these folks made it a destination to be here. And they are bringing vitality in every way. So it's a great time to be in Lakewood. And this is another affirmation of where we are in our peers. So this particular graph shows where we are in terms of our housing valuation compared to the rest of the region. And you can see that the folks to uh, the right, um, my left, your right, uh, are not generally who we view as our peer communities. You look to all the cities to the left who are the normal inner ring suburbs, and we can see we're in a very favorable position. That gives us great strength. Um, our challenge is to maintain it. And I know City Council and I are, and the future mayor likely will absolutely be riveted to do that. Now we can't let safety out of our minds for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> state-of-the-art communications, upgrading dispatch capability, the soon-to-be-released police to citizen portable portal, you know, our citizens' eyes and ears, we've talked about that, how important that is. Response times are critical, as we've mentioned, three minutes, four minutes. Fire, we are grateful that we have uh, fire representatives who are probably on shift and if they run out of here in a hurry, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly understand. But, you know, they show up at a uh, tier one alarm, uh, three minutes, perhaps, maybe four, and they show up with four firefighters on a rig, and they are prepared to get that inch and a quarter line into that house, probably within minutes, and what could be a small kitchen fire remains that. Two minutes after that, it's not a small kitchen fire. Lives are at risk, houses are at risk, and whole blocks could be in risk. So we're grateful for the integrity, the commitment, and the investment that our safety forces give to us each day. And I'd like to share a story that happened about a couple weeks ago. You likely saw some of this on the news. We know that there was a very bad actor, actually was accused of four murders in Florida, who ended up in Lakewood. Perhaps you knew about that. It was on the news, uh, caught in Lakewood was this uh, very, very dangerous fellow. What you don't know is uh, that the incident and his capture ended very safely and to the casual eye, it was a non-event. But I have to tell you, I had the privilege of watching the events unfold that day. 
and how we leveraged the technology of our license plate reader cameras, our diligence and knowledge of detectives, uh, help and support from Tarpon Springs, Florida detectives, and we were able to identify that in fact this person was in our city and his car was spotted on Newman Avenue at about noon on a Thursday. What you didn't know uh, was that from that moment until about 7.30 that night was four law enforcement agencies, the FBI, Violent Fugitive Task Force, our West Shore SWAT team, and Lakewood Police worked in great harmony and collaboration, cycling in and out of a very vigorous surveillance of that property for seven and a half hours, and it was a very cold day, by the way, uh, and the circumstances of what was about to happen, who was in that house, uh, and it was determined that the, uh, the perpetrator was in the house and he had two children, so potential hostages. Well, long story short, someday I'd like to tell you the details. Uh, uh, through a very clever use of tactics, uh, communication, and it, they were able to lure uh, this person out of the house and they grabbed him. We were prepared to evacuate Newman Avenue. We were prepared to host these folks overnight, uh, get them out of harm's way, and our worst scenario was a standoff that could have ended very dangerously and violently. But it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because of the extreme preparedness, teamwork, capability, technology, and training that our public safety forces experienced and gave to us that night. I'm proud of them, <clears throat> and I'm very happy to tell this story when I can. And I'm grateful to give you a little bit of a uh, tantalization of what it is. And someday we'll talk more about it. Mm -hmm. Now we know that we are a community choice also for development. We've seen uncompared bridal, uh, investment probably since the early 1960s when the Gold Coast was built. And we've created a really refined ability to accept, shape, and build a diverse list of development projects. And those are important elements because developers show up with their preconceived ideas of what should happen in Lakewood. But Lakewood shows up with their sense of what should happen in Lakewood. And it's a very involved process, and it's vigorous, and it requires engagement and, and involvement from our citizens and neighbors around these, and we get it. So through this process, we've been able to create harmonized investments in our community. And today, we have three more on the way, and we're engaged in that process. The plan development process that has been developed by our planning department um, has demonstrated that when we invite developers into that, it creates more control by city council. Ultimately, city council will cast a vote over each of these critical developments. That's an important element of citizen responsibility, and they take that role very, very seriously. We have these boards and commissions, planning commission and an architectural board of review, who work very hard to represent the interests of the neighbors and neighborhoods. And these are neighbors, and they live in our neighborhoods, and they understand what's at stake. That process takes a good generally a good starting point, and it makes it a great outcome. It's vigorous, it's long, developers are prepared for it, they're told what's ahead, they're coached of how they need to improve, how they need to bring their A game, and they do. So I, my challenge to city council and to the future mayor is to maintain the integrity of that planned process. It takes our zoning, which is the normal tool that communities use as their defense, and puts it in a much higher category of control. That's what has been the Lakewood way of development. We need to maintain that process. So we've gotten a lot done. We've shown that we can demonstrate that we can actually produce results. And as a consequence, we have the luxury of being a community of choice. Now, I know there was a lot of concern, rightly so, about the challenge of the hospital, its impact on our community in so many ways, and its economic impact as a, our largest private sector employer. Uh, and we also know that New York Life uh, wanted a Class A space. Uh, they were in a building that was built in the 70s, and by any stretch, it was Class C space, and it's probably its day that it opened. Uh, and there was no way we were able to compete today. Now, we're hoping that three or four years from now, we will have Class A space here. But we couldn't compete to keep that employer in our community as well. And we all worried uh, what the impact would be. The great news is Lakewood is not a company town. The strength of all of our employers, and, and there's about, I think, 6,000 of them. Um, and there's 170 of them, by the way, that are in the healthcare delivery business. 
And we have about 170 folks that deliver food uh, to citizens every day. So that's a very vibrant uh, economic nest that we've created. And as a consequence, um, we have seen enormous, uh, first a stabilization, not a decline of our withhold or our employer withholding, which is the payroll dollars in our community. And in 2019, we saw a significant rise. And that's before we get the benefit of much of the development that's about to happen and will start to show up in 2022, particularly in the hospital site. So the good news is not only are we in strong shape today, our financial footing is as solid as it should be and it will continue to get better. Now, we have an obligation to think about the impact of Mother Nature and our use of energy and our responsibility in terms of uh, others in the world, especially next generation. So we think about what our sustainable efforts are. That means how we can take less than we used to take out of our, in, out of our society, that we can add more positive impacts to it, and that we can be good stewards of, of the responsibility of natural resources. So we formed a resiliency task force. We announced that last year. That group is hard at work to identify the external threats that challenge cities like Lakewood. And their best work is yet to come. And so to city council and to the future mayor, I say let's create capacity to benefit from this hard thinking that's, that's, that's coming at us. And, and make sure that every investment we make is respectful of the future of Lakewood and how it needs to sh change to be more respectful. We've made investments in technology. We have green stormwater capture systems all over the city with more to come. We're about to begin to implement this methane capture investment, a $7 million investment in our wastewater treatment plant. This is where our anaerobic digesters, where the hard solids actually decay, and when they do, they create methane. Historically, we burned off that methane, but this next technology that we're about to put on top of these digesters will capture all that methane, divert it to a generator, and we will power one-third of the energy requirements of a wastewater treatment plant just by recycling the energy we produce there. That's a good example of how cities need to think and behave. As we speak, we're seeing LED lights put on Detroit and Madison. Uh, we're working with First Energy. And I would say to City Council and the future mayor, we may need to challenge First Energy more than we have in the past. Uh, they have a big case of the slows. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we have probably more of an appetite for capacity than they have. And they are in the way. They are in the way. And they, uh, this is a project that started last summer. It's finally being implemented. It will save us one quarter of the energy cost of the streetlights on Madison, Detroit. It's a four-year payback. Let's think of the impact of that, of our $600,000 streetlight bill annually across the city. However, LED light is different. And we'll be able to evaluate the quality of that light and see what it means to us and decide whether we want that kind of light, if not how we can shape it on our residential streets. Because it's brighter. It's clearer. It's cheaper. It's more reliable. It requires less maintenance. Those are good things, but it is different. So we look forward to finding out about that light and seeking ways we can expand it. You know we've invested in bike infrastructure. That is a great investment in sustainability. Every time we do not turn the key to our cars on and the carbon emissions that that car produces and the energy that it consumes, and we use other modes of transportation, pedestrian, uh, bike, all those are critical elements of how a city ought to think and behave. And we're encouraging in every way how we can be better at that. Recycling, some solar. Uh, we have uh, actually a $206,000 NOPEC grant that we look forward to working together with City Council to figure out how we can be innovative there. Uh, we have electric vehicle charging station at our city center park. We have a rapid charger that's about ready to be invested in at Winterhurst, and that will allow a, um, a, a renter to be able to show up and charge their full battery in about a half an hour. And one of the challenges for us is how can a renter avail themselves to the future of electric cars since they don't have garages to park their cars in and charge them as I do with my electric car and Tom Bullock does with his electric car. So we're figuring out how we might experiment with that. And that's one avenue, perhaps others that will be important to us. Now, the broadest topic we think about every day is improving quality of life. And of course, our parks are essential to that. Remember that 54% of our citizens who are renters, our parks are their backyard, and our shared space is critical to our quality of experience, both as neighbors and neighborhoods. 
We spent $6 million in the last eight years. We're about to spend another million on Wager Park, which is at the intersection of Madison and Hilliard. And midpoint this summer, likely that park will actually be scraped clean and we'll level it and rebuild it. And that design has been in the process. It's been vigorously worked with by our citizens in that neighborhood. And it'll be a very exciting vitality. And about 25,000 Lakewood residents can walk to that park. That's a great example of a centrally located place that's vital to a vibrant neighborhood. And we're about to keep that investment. It's a city council and the future mayor, I say, stay on that path. We've made great investments. We have to maintain them. But things change, and we have to create the capacity. We know swimming pools ought to be part of that. Commercial investments, the Lakewood Hospital site, uh, demolition is on schedule. And with a good fortune, actually, things will start to go vertical late this fall. Uh, we have worked a process to choose a, um, a new developer, and the developer is working hard to bring future tenants to that location. And we look forward to hopefully having some announcements soon. So we also have some exciting integration. We're going to talk in a moment about our human services and our investments on some of our more vulnerable neighbors and investments on each and every one of our neighbors. So we have a letter of intent signed with the Methodist Church for $900,000 to purchase Cove Church. Cove Church is at the intersection of Cove, Clifton, and Lake. It's 1.7 acres of land. It happens to be strategically located uh, and probably within walking distance of our greatest population of senior citizens, both at Lakeshore Towers, the Gold Coast, and actually, if we triangulate between Feeder Manor and uh, the Westerly, um, it's probably as central as we might get, plus a few hundred feet maybe to the south. Uh, so it's circumstantial uh, that we should find it there, but we know that if we were to find 1.7 acres or seek it at any point in the future, other than when it's opportunistically available, we would not be successful. So we have the opportunity to buy this land. We have some unique one-time money left over from a long ago estate tax that came to us, uh, what, in 2007 or eight? Uh, what? 14. 2014. Uh, and we have the ability to make this investment. This will bring 16,000 square feet, 8,000 square foot per floor of the ability to reprogram a multi-generational experience. If you can imagine our seniors on one floor, our family room for our youngest early childhood folks on another floor, our family to family social work grants intermingled around that neighborhood, and then in the evening, it will be open to perhaps all citizens for all types of programming and experiences that we've never been able to enjoy. It uniquely has parking, which is a rarity for us, and we have the ability to make something we've never had before. So I look for it's likely that I won't be here to cut that ribbon, uh, but I look forward to supporting City Council and their efforts and the future mayor uh, and that investment. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that's unique is it's situated on a bus route and certainly has great uh, bike and pedestrian access as well. So Cove Church, more to come on that important investment. Now, the role of the mayor is extensive. Uh, in fact, I will tell you, uh, there's, I became, I was, last summer I was, went to the U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting in Boston. I was introduced to this, what is now one of my favorite quotes. Lyndon Johnson, when confronted in great moments of despair in his presidency, and we know there were such great moments, uh, was often uh, heard to say, well, it could be worse. I could be a mayor. <laughs> uh, he understood uniquely, I think, the responsibilities of, of public uh, service, but at the mayor's level, it's personal and it's upfront and it's local. So here in Lakewood in particular, because of all the things we've identified tonight, the mayor of Lakewood must be a regional voice for progress. We have the ability with our staff, our strengths, and our depths of experiences to pioneer new ways of how cities in Northeast Ohio can think and behave. We have the financial capacity. With strength and ability comes obligation. And we are uniquely positioned, I think, to help show the city of that future and share that wisdom with folks who have fewer resources but are challenged by the same issues we are, who are our neighbors in the region. We have, as a mayor, you have to be the chief storyteller to the Environmental Protection Agency, as we did yesterday, uh, to the NOACA conversation, which is our metropolitan planning organization, where we spend $40 million a year of federal transportation money. 
And one of those voices that I shared recently was the challenge to divert Lake Erie water into the Ohio River watershed for economic redevelopment. Now, I know from experience in talking to other mayors, and particularly in Milwaukee, that once you tap the Great Lakes and you take that water of our watershed, Katie bar the door in terms of what that means to using our greatest resource to fuel development elsewhere. So um, knowing the stories that I've heard and my responsibilities here, I felt confident and clear that I could make that voice, and I know other mayors joined me in it. But that's an example where you have to understand the subtleties of our, of our region and have the confidence of the voice that Lakewood in particular can raise. We have to be, as a mayor, an assessor and an advocate for our citizens at every level. We have to protect them. We have to invest wisely. Every hard-earned tax dollar has to be thought through very carefully in terms of its impact. And we have to anticipate the future. And in order to do that, we draw heavily on the experiences of our great citizenry, our resiliency task force, our boards and commissions, our city council, uh, both current and future. Um, and we have to create alignment with all of the other folks striving to improve Lakewood. Ian Andrews and Lakewood Alive, Patty Ryan, who I know is here, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Board of Education, and the investments they've made. And to this day, I remember with great sense of pride that first bond levy mm -hmm. where Lakewood faced the challenge of investing in its second century schools and passed that $100 million bond levy. Jay Fran, who was here, led that campaign. To me, that was one of the single greatest stakes in the ground of the future of what the citizens felt they could and should do. And then they proceeded to do 200 million more worth of investment. And that is one of the variables that I think has driven our successful rebound. Now, I would argue a very substantial variable, and I applaud the leadership of our Board of Vacations. <laughs> and so when we think about our future, it includes many parties. And in public policy in particular, it's really not about control, it's about alignment. It's really about directing folks in the same direction and trying to leverage and shepherd each other towards these shared goals that we all have. And by doing so, we create synergies that we know have paid off in spades for our great city. Well, we have not had an open mayor's race since 1995, 25 years ago, when Mayor Harbarger chose not to run again so it was the first time, uh, and quite some time then, and it's been some quite some time since then, 25 years since we've had an open mayor's race. So I feel obligated, and maybe a, a, a little sense of opportunity to share some advice to the future of Lakewood, to its citizens, you, and the votes that you will cast, and also to the leaders who will assume these responsibilities. So number one, uh, municipal government is about delivering core services. So the mayor of Lakewood must stay focused on everyday services. Folks like Jack Palamaki, who shares experience with Buzz, who does a great job picking up the leaves in his neighborhood. Now, Buzz is a great employee. We have all great employees. And Buzz does a great job doing a fundamentally important task of picking up leaves with great equipment that we've invested in. But the point is we get the leaves picked up. That's a great example of a core service. Uh, and we have 22 different service platforms. It's a very complicated uh, service environment, uh, and we have to do them all well. And so you have to stay focused on how are we doing and what can we do better and what will it take to do that better. We need to strive to create the alignment that I talked about a moment ago and continue to work with all our partners. And that takes uh, communication. I meet with Superintendent Robinson uh, and previous superintendents every month. Uh, and we have very, very engaged conversations about shared concerns, both in his responsibilities, having the organizational leadership of a very complex and large organization, and we are able to, we use this, we have served the same taxpayer, and we have delightful conversations, as I did with Joe Maddock, as I did with Jeff Patterson, and as I do with Mike Robinson. So uh, we are grateful for uh, that conversation, but there are many more that have to continue to be invested in. We have to address the hard issues. We're looking at a picture of the Family Health Center. We know it didn't arrive without a lot of consideration. Facing up the hard issues is, uh, takes responsible leadership. It may not always, we may not always agree on the path of that leadership, and that's okay. The point is we need to put the hard issues in front of us. 
And I would say that my 40 years of organizational leadership, one thing that I've learned, often the hard way, is that hard problems do not get better with time. Facing them earlier preserves more options, not less. Procrastination and avoidance limits our options. So facing them in front of us and not being afraid to do so and not be ashamed to do so. It has to be a hallmark of how we, we look at the future. It always seems politically easier to delay, but it is not responsible leadership, and I think you know that. We look at the hospital and the hard issues that brought to us, state budget cuts in 2011, 12, and 13, the Great Recession facing up to that drama, Clean Water Act and its impact on us is a hard issue. Maintaining staff levels is a hard issue. Making sure that we have employees who want to come and work here in the future, that's a challenge, but we're facing up to it. And I would say to City Council and the future mayors of Lakewood, stay focused on that. And I would say communication, you know today is probably harder than ever. We're distracted. We, when, when you think of um, major epistles coming from of our federal government in 170 characters, and that armies move on 170 characters, uh, and that millions and billions are invested on 170 characters, what a world we're in. But the fact of the matter is we have to do better because these are not easy issues. And there is not always one right answer. There are many paths we can take to achieve the same goal. It's okay to disagree. What's not okay is to view that disagreements are adversarial. We have to be respectful of that. But communication is a lubrication, sharing information, harder than ever, more important than ever, 24-7. And you saw, and perhaps I hope you received recently, our fourth Lakewood Life edition. That's an analog world of ink on paper. And we realized that we maybe had missed an important step where with all the tools we have and the way the press is going in journalism today and social media that maybe we were doing okay. Ultimately, we decided we were not doing okay and we needed to do a better job. And sometimes you gotta go back to the basics. Ink on paper, delivered to your doorstep, sharing important information remains a critical element of what we need to achieve. So, we have an obligation to communicate. And this is not advancing. Um, All right, um, pocketbooks of hardworking citizens. Median household income of Lakewood, $47,000. We are below the state average. That means half our citizens make less than $47,000, half the households make more. So we are many Lakewoods, we have always been that way. We view economic diversity as a strength, but it's a challenge to many of our households. And it's gonna be even more of a challenge in the future. The income gap of our country and its impact on, on issues of policy and democracy and republic and who feels left in and who feels left out, no doubt challenges the very fabric of what we consider the hallmark of how we behave as the United States. So we have at this level to be very respectful of every dollar. And think about the implications and challenge ourselves. And I know City Council does every bit of that and their responsibilities of setting our budget. They worked extremely hard this year and every year and they, um, they will continue to do so, I'm sure. But we have to stay focused on that pocketbook and think about that household and what our services mean to that person. And from that, we can continue to make the best decisions that we can. Um, now, this is a picture of a garbage truck. But what you don't know is this is an experimentation. Underneath this garbage truck, perhaps not this exact one because we couldn't get the picture, but one just like it, our ground sensors. We're working collaboratively with Case Western Reserve University Department of Engineering and Cleveland State University Department of Engineering to test and evaluate sensors. We happen to mount them underneath two garbage trucks. We have the potential to use those sensing technologies. They're probably not working as well today as they ultimately will, but they'll be able to assess pavement condition. They'll be able to assess the um, intensity of water moving through a, a water main eight to 10 feet below the surface and to tell, determine whether there's turbulence such that that might indicate a leak uh, and flow or low flow volume. And they'll also be able to assess uh, the intensity of sewer volume in big storms just by driving across the street. This sets the table for the city of the future, both here and everywhere. 
Now we have 60 surveillance cameras, 55 I think across the city, but each one of those cameras has an eight port hub. We use one of the ports for the camera, that leaves seven ports available in 55 locations, and we'll have more, that we can connect data gathering intelligence to better assess, respond, and allocate our scarce resources. That's the city of the future. How we do that, frankly, I don't know. But I am certain that this city council and the future mayors will grapple with that very issue. And I'm also certain that we have citizens in this room and other rooms that will help us to do that. And that we also will leverage alignment of our partners, including Case West Reserve and Cleveland State and others, to make sure that we use these tools well. But we are well positioned to drive the smart city of Lakewood as we define it to be. And that, my friends, is an exciting conversation. So innovate. Now this young citizen will experience and, and continue to experience the evolution of Lakewood. Very different from what I experienced the Lakewood when I was his age. The foundation we've built thus far gives us a good starting point. So to city council, future mayors, I would say build on that foundation. I'm very fond of, uh, of, of a concept that was introduced to uh, last year, that culture eats strategy for lunch. Now the great news is the culture of Lakewood is vibrant. And from that culture, we will create great strategies but let's not forget the culture. And lastly, let me just say one other guideline that I think about a lot is the chance favors the prepared mind. And I learned that from a couple Nobel laureates at a summer vacation that we heard a lecture, Wendy and I. By the way, I introduced Wendy. Uh, 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 sorry, Wendy. And I see Cindy Marks, our former council representative as well. Cindy. Uh, but these Nobel laureates were talking about how they actually made these Nobel award-winning discoveries. And many times they were heading left and they hit a wall, but they were prepared for and, and looking for innovation. And so they veered to the right. And when they did so, they saw what ultimately was the breakthrough technology. So it isn't always clear how you're going to get there, but a prepared mind is able to uh, leverage the chances that, that come in front of them. And to city council and to future mayors, I would say make sure that we're ready for that chance and we will continue to do so. So um, creating a capacity of investment, we know that that has paid off in spades for our city. So let me conclude with a personal reflection. So my arrival as the mayor's office as an appointee was likely the only way I would have gotten here. But I have viewed each day that I have served in this important role as an important call to civic duty. And I know all of you who, you who are elected do as well. This has not been a career move for me. I have not considered political consequences. Sometimes I wished I had. Uh, and clearly no politician, especially a good one, would advocate for the emotional healthcare transition that ultimately resulted in the closing of our beloved hospital and then run for re-election in 2015. Uh, but I viewed that as facing up to the hard issues. And I have viewed my responsibility to confront every hard issue head on and not can kick, kick the proverbial can down the road. I've had the personal pleasure to work and with and support great leaders and managers both within this organization and inside this region as well. The issues and the opportunities that this government has addressed these past years have been a great personal challenge for me. And I've drawn on every fiber of my experience, my training, and my upbringing. I have worked as hard as I know how, and I've given it my best. And for this, I remain very grateful to you for giving me this opportunity. But I'll finish hard. We have 10 months left, and I encourage all of us to work together for the betterment of Lakewood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I tell you, like Lyndon Johnson, I'm, I'm grateful, grateful for the, for the support tonight. Uh, and, and frankly, what I consider to be almost every night. Uh, 
But let's take a moment, if we can, and we've been our custom, I know that's for probably longer than we intended to be, to address any questions or concerns that you might have. We won't take long here, uh, and I respect your time, but is there anything comes to mind while we have this unique opportunity to be together? Yes, sir, Brad? Brad asked a, probably the most seminally important question, I think, of the next 10 months and perhaps years, and City Council has been part of this conversation, and boy, buckle your seatbelts, folks, you know, here we go. So the, the central challenge is whether or not City of Lakewood can exercise its responsibilities on its own terms. And by working with regulators like the Ohio EPA and the federal EPA, who Brad refers to correctly has really one fix, and that's a federal consent decree put in place by a federal judge. Over the cross, uh, over the parts of the, uh, the, all parts of the country, those consent degrees have been the law of the land and the strategy of enforcement. The problem is they're very onerous, they play a big financial burden on a city, and they're highly inflexible. It's been our mission to avoid that consent decree responsibly, and thus far we've been able to do so. Um, fortunately, with the hard work of I would say particularly mayors across the country, and I can't give any credit personally to this, but I was supporting those mayors, and I would lay a special accolade to Mayor Dave Berger of Lima, Ohio, who has done, Mayor Berger's been a mayor for over 30 years in Lima, and he faced some of the early regulatory challenges in Ohio, and he has been a stalwart on behalf of cities across the country to help change the way the laws are written and enforced. On January 14th of this year, signed into law, it was the last day that it could be signed, by the way, before it would have become a pocket veto, was a new federal law that recognizes integrated planning and recognizes long-term implementation strategies and recognizes the enforcement as regulated by the five-year or 10-year permit of the Ohio EPA, is, or states like the Ohio EPA is the primary regulator. Lou McMahon, uh, Justin McCauley, and I traveled yesterday to meet with the new director of the Ohio EPA, who we mentioned is coming up here in May. And boy, are we going to show her a good time. Uh, the, uh, and we have more confidence today than I think at any time we have that we can thread the needle. But we have our work ahead of us. We have a very good plan. It's very responsible in its engineering. It's respectful of the pocketbooks, but will challenge the pocketbooks of this community. Uh, and will likely put us up against a wall, ultimately. And we have the right to uh, defend ourselves against that, that process. So I'm confident. Uh, I can't be certain, but we have more to work with. And boy, we're gonna, we've got a lot of tools and a great plan. So we're going to work at that. The big difference would be like the federal could come in and say, clean it up in five years. Well, usually 20. Like yeah, I mean, our worst fear is they say, uh, spend $200 million in 20 years. Uh, we think a responsible... Investment is 75 million in 15 years, uh, and we can make great headway with plans recognizing the evolution of technology and um, how we can respect neighbors, neighborhoods, pocketbooks, and the environment. We have a plan that will actually demonstrate how we're going to do that. You'll see it March 1st, uh, and boy, it's a page turner, let me tell you. Uh, I envision getting a Pulitzer Prize for this great, uh, great epistle. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Come, to, come before us. Emma? Oh, Mayor Summers, thank you very much for your, your disclosure today. One thing I was wondering um, with regard to especially the, the fact that we've been really blessed with increasing values in our homes and things like that is what do you see and recommendations that you might have, especially for future leadership in regard to how we can still maintain some affordable housing here in Lakewood? Yeah. That's a great question, too. With, with rising prosperity, we know in our, our country, in our city, it doesn't lift everybody at the same pace. Lakewood, for those of us with the privilege of growing up here, and I know many of you did, 
understood that you went to school with folks that had more than you and less than you. And we didn't care. We recognized that that didn't matter to our experience here. My best friend growing up, his dad was both a bakery truck driver and a bookie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we didn't realize the bookie piece till later, but uh, uh, the, uh, so, the, so the idea of, of, of having that diversity is baked into what we have to protect. So how? Uh, we, um, we, we're, we're, we're working hard to assess what is affordable housing, what is its capacity today, how many units at what price point. We know that housing insecurity has two, two drivers to it, one of which is the cost of the house, the rent, or the mortgage you pay, and also the cost of the commute to the job that you have. So that to actually deal with effective housing insecurity challenges, we have to look at where jobs are created, close by we hope, and how we can create avenues of transportation of these folks cheaply and reliably. Car ownership isn't for everybody, and that puts a burden on that household. So mass transit and investments are part of that, in, that, that con consideration. Uh, we have to recognize that we may have to create incentives for landlords. We introduced the uh, process to our landlords uh, two weeks ago about how we invited CMHA to come in and share the experience of the housing choice voucher. Uh, and uh, we have about 300 such vouchers in Lakewood, and about half of them are with the senior citizens, and half of them are not. Actually, I'm gonna need, I've been working, uh, begun the conversation with your superintendent to understand the fact that 45% of Lakewood school students qualify for free or reduced lunch. By our mutual calculation, that's about 2,200 students, roughly. And if there are two students per household, that's about 1,000 households, roughly. So I want to know about the experience of those 1,000 households. What do they look like? We know that they're stressed. Uh, how Are they able to stay here? What is their rent condition? So I think we have a lot of research that we need to undertake. It's sensitive, but I think we have to be very thoughtful. I know that uh, Bryce Sylvester and his planning staff is figuring out how to create more income uh, qualified housing units. We actually have two coming online in Birdtown today. I think you have plans to offer maybe four or five more that will use some of our block grant money to subsidize the development of this housing that allows us then to restrict it to folks who in are income qualified. But five or six housing is probably not enough. Uh, we, uh, I think that's a thoughtful challenge. When I was in Boston last year, I learned how delicate these strategies are. In fact, what I learned was the Boston Mass Transit, the MTA, spent $10 million extending a mass transit line to a low-income neighborhood, thinking that that would create this linkage. All it did was accelerate the gentrification of that low-income neighborhood. So it actually backfired. So $10 million later, it didn't work. And so I've learned you've got to be very thoughtful about not creating unintended consequences. So I would challenge us as a Board of Education and as a city government to be very thoughtful of how we can figure out how we can protect these citizens. It's not easy, but it's an important conversation, and it is a national conversation. You see that across cities, and we look forward to benefiting from that. So let's work together on that one. Thank you for asking that question. Those are great questions, and how can you top those? Um, but certainly somebody can. Well, look, you've been very kind, so let's adjourn tonight. I'll be up here if someone would like to address any particular question, but I thank you for your engagement in Lakewood.